For the first time, the Navy SEAL says he killed Osama bin Laden is going public in an exclusive interview with Esquire magazine. It's the March cover story with the blunt headline, The Man Who Killed Osama bin Laden is Screwed. And the article makes the case that the Navy SEAL, who served for 16 years, is leaving the Navy without any security, job prospects, or insurance for his family. Esquire contributor Phil Bronstein spent more than a year getting to know him. His name remains a secret for his own safety, obviously, and his family's. He was a member of the exclusive SEAL Team 6, and after the bin Laden mission, he retired to no pension, no health benefits beyond the first five years, and none at all for his family, and no security despite killing the world's most wanted terrorist. Phil Bronstein joins me tonight with more. Your article is fascinating, not only for the details it has about the, the raid that killed bin Laden, but also about what this, SEAL, what this Navy SEAL is facing once he leaves. I didn't realize that he wasn't eligible for VA benefits for the rest of his life. Well, he's not. He's eligible for one thing, and that is the VA has five years of free medical care for the vet, not for the family. It's care. It's not insurance. And the fact is, is that a huge number of people, including the shooter, don't know it exists because the DOD does a very poor job of letting them know. So this, but this Navy SEAL, who's had this incredible career, um, leaves with no pension, no health insurance. No health insurance, for his certainly for himself and his family, and no protection, which is really one of the big issues because it's entirely possible his name could come out. Matt Bissonette wrote a book. Within days, his picture was on a jihadi website. And all the SEAL command told this, this shooter was, we have a witness protection program that we could institute. It's not there yet. But if you want to drive a beer truck in Milwaukee, we can arrange that. You just have to cut all your ties to the rest of your family and basically disappear yourself. What, in terms of what he told you about the raid, what surprised you most? I think that he, I think the, the fact that it happened so fast, but that he had certain images in his mind, mm -hmm. you know, particularly the shooting of bin Laden. I mean, he, there was one moment when he said, you know, I had to raise my gun because I really didn't expect him to be, he was really tall. He was surprised at how tall he was. Surprised at how tall he was. Um, and I think that was sort of an, it, that was sort of my most enlightening moment for me in the sense that it was really a human moment. He also recognized in that instance, you know, I, I would try and talk to this guy and, and realize that, okay, this guy was one foot away from this icon, right. this, this cultural icon and we'd learned whose face we'd, we'd know, known since 9-11. And suddenly, here's this really regular guy. I mean, he's a SEAL, and they're extraordinary. But he's a human being. So what struck me about his narrative of the mission was not so much all of the detail, some of which, much of which we've heard before, but his human reaction to it. Well, and his reaction upon shooting bin Laden and sort of registering what he had done, he, he, the, the sort of the phrase that he, that he said to himself. Well, he said, you know, I, I've just shot Osama bin Laden. I don't know whether that's, I've just done the best thing in my life, meaning he'd pay tribute to the people of New York and the people of the United States, done his job, or the worst thing in my life, which was to put a target on his back. And, and he is concerned about that. I mean, he has now taught his family how to protect themselves in the event somebody comes for him. Well, he and his wife <coughs> describe this in an astonishing way because he's, he's taught her, put the kids in the tub because there's a retaining wall there, then sit next door in the bedroom, sit on the bed, brace your arm with a gun against the wall so it doesn't kick, and then shoot through the door. Uh, they can't, they don't even have their military IDs anymore, so they can't, if she feels there's a problem or they feel there's a problem, they can't even take their family to the command and get, and get right in the gate. The, the guy you've been talking to, who you profile, it must have been difficult for him to even talk to you. Well, I'd say at first it was impossible as it is impossible, as you've discovered in many cases. What happened is we got to know each other over time. This is a year and a quarter. In-person meetings, phone calls, a lot of communication. I know his wife, um, his family, some members of his family, his friends. And so, you know, trust built slowly. And the point of this, you know, he had the go, no-go button in his hand up until the very end. He could have said, you know, I don't want to do this. I think he, he came to believe that if he could tell this story, that people would understand that these guys aren't Jason Bourne, they're not supernatural, they're fabulous, but they're, but they're human. And if they're human, like any human being, you know, they need some support and they need some help at various times in their lives. When he actually shot in London, I mean, they were within 10 inches, he, he says, of, uh, he, of each other. The shooter rolled in, into the room and as he entered the doorway, he describes there's bin Laden 
pushing with his standing, with his hands on his younger wife Amal's, youngest wife Amal's shoulders, pushing her forward, or she's leading him forward. And of course, it's pitch black for, for anybody in the house, but these guys have goggles. And they're sort of moving this way toward, not exactly at the door and him, but kind of across a little bit. And he's literally, he says, about 10 inches. His gun is 10 inches from, from bin Laden's head. He, he makes his observation in that in instant and then shoots one shot and in the forehead, directly in the forehead. Second shot as bin Laden's going down, and when, as he's crumpled at the bottom of the bed, third shot in the forehead. There's also an interesting detail in the article that after the raid was done, and they're back, I guess, in Jalalabad, I guess it was, and the CIA analyst, the woman who is the one who's been spearheading this whole effort and uh, had made this her life's work, he actually, the shooter gave the magazine uh, from, from his weapon to her. And the shooter had had contact with her, as had other members of the assault team. And she was there. They pull the body in. They, they unzip it from the bag, take it out so Admiral McRaven, head of Special Forces, can see it. Um, and then he sees her, and he asks her to come over, and he said, is this your guy? And then he takes that. It's actually been proposed to him by the point man that you give her something. Mm -hmm. And he took his magazine out, which had 27 bullets, minus the three he'd shot bin Laden with. And he said, I hope you have room for this in your backpack. Mm -hmm. That was the last time he saw her. It's a, it's a fascinating article. Um, thanks Thank for you. talking about it. Thanks for having me on. Well, we asked the Navy for a response to the Esquire article and statement. They told us, and I quote, we take seriously the safety and security of our people as well as our responsibility to assist sailors making a transition to civilian life. Without more information about this particular case, it would be difficult to determine the degree to which our transition programs succeeded.